beginning of Mark chapter 13. This is what Jesus wants to talk to his disciples about, knowing he is about to leave them, is that there's going to be an end to all of this. To talk in worldview terms, there was a beginning, and there's going to be an end to what happens in this world. Christ came from eternity past. He will be in eternity future. And those that have known him will be with him in eternity future. But make no mistake about it, everybody has an eternity, whether you're saved or not. Whether you know Jesus Christ or not. There is an eternity to live with. And, and what Mark wants to us to know through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that there are specific things that are going to happen that that we need to understand in order for us to have some urgency here. If we're going to be urgent about the, the things that are happening around us now, we need to understand what's going to happen in the days ahead. Maybe that will light a fuse under some of us to understand that. Now, we did two and a half years in this room right here on Wednesday nights working our way through the book of Revelation. For those of you that were with us through that, this is going to kind of be a very quick recap. Can you imagine two and a half years in the next 40 minutes? Okay, that's what Mark's going to attempt to do here, is give us some background. So there's a biblical worldview, and that biblical worldview is linear. In other words, there, there is a beginning, there's all this time in between, and then there is an end that is coming to this world. That's the linear worldview. Now, that's not how a lot of people think today in other parts of the world. They think sort of the circular worldview. Okay, we go around and we just we get reincarnated back into other places and we do other things and we come back again and again and again. That's, that's a different worldview. Well, Jesus taught that we should watch for the end and watch for certain things to happen that will give us signs toward the end. Now, remember... What's happening here, this is the message Jesus chooses to give his disciples right before he goes to the cross. We've, just got, we've got another four weeks here that we're going to look at messages right before the cross, and we're basically going to go through just a, a, almost a chapter a, a week. So understand that's what's happening. The cross references here, if you're taking notes of the Olivet Discord, are not just um, Mark chapter 13, but also Matthew 24 and Luke 21 has the same basic storyline. Now, why is that important? It's important because each one of these people, it'd be like, okay, all of you are sitting in different parts of the room this morning. If somebody was to come in here and interview you afterwards as to what would take in place, Sherry would have a different story than Linda would have over here. Why? Because she's seen it from a different perspective. Certain words jump out at her more. Certain events that are happening, she catches, and, and maybe Sherry doesn't, or vice versa. That's the way real life it works. And so each one of these apostles are giving us a perspective and an understanding of things they picked up on while this was going on. Who's coming into the room? What's taking place? What is he talking about? So that's the purpose of us looking at these cross-references here. So let's look at Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse number 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple that day, one of his disciples said, Teacher, look at these tremendous buildings. Look at the, at the massive stones in the wall. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, some of the stones in the wall are twice as long as a man and as tall as a man is high. Think about in, in primitive times how that must have been to move those stones and place them just so. And there's places in these stones, they're fitted so well together that you could take this card and not stick it between those stones. Now think what a, what a miraculous thing that was that they set all of this in place. And he's looking at these stones and he says, look at this, Jesus. Isn't this in incredible? And it was an incredible sight. Jesus replied, these magnificent buildings will be so completely demolished that not one stone will be left on top of another. That's what's going to happen here. Can you imagine the shock that comes over the disciples with this prophecy coming from Jesus? Later, Jesus sat on the slope, this is at Mount of Olives, across the valley from the temple. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew came to him 
privately. So they're still, got, they're still thinking about this conversation. They're still thinking about not one stone left on another. What, what, what would it take for that to happen? I mean, even if we had a massive earthquake, surely of these huge stones all piled up, if you've seen pictures on television of the whaling wall, you know, all of those stones, for not one to be left on top of another, they're still, they're still trying to comprehend what was Jesus trying to say to us. So when, when will this take place, Jesus? And, and will there be any sign ahead of time to show us when this is about to be fulfilled? Now, think about this just a minute. From a purely human perspective, let's step outside of the church goer for the moment. From the purely human perspective, they're probably thinking, well, we, I, I want to have some warning of this before this kind of event takes place. Maybe I'll get right with God before then. You know, I had this fella in Arkansas. It's actually my, my secretary's husband. And... Uh, he, every time I'd talk to him, he'd say, one day, I'm, I'm, when, when, when I get close to the end of my life, one day I'm going I'm to get right with the Lord. One day I'm going to get things put together. One, one of these days, it's, it, but I, I'm, somehow I'm going to know when I'm getting close. And then I remember one day when I came into the office and she said, he's gone. He died last night. Jesus is telling them ahead of time because he wanted them to start right now. And he, he wants all of us to have the same kind of urgency as well. So they're saying, when will these things be fulfilled? Here's the, the quote from Matthew 24 this, around this same event. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Now, for those of you that were with us for, for the Revelation story, you can probably read into this that they're really talking about two events here. But probably in their mind at this time, they didn't have the benefit of the Word of God that we do today. They didn't have the benefit of all of the New Testament that we do today. Probably in their mind, they thought this was the same event. They probably thought this, this reference here of these things, which meaning the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, the destruction of the wall, not one stone laying on top of another, that actually happens in 70 AD. So just probably 40 years from the time of this event, less than 40 years from the time of this event, till these things, the, the destruction of the temple is going to happen. But then there's this other event that refers to the end of history as we know it, the end of the physical world as we know it. They probably have this conflated in their minds, but this is two distinctly different events in history that are going to happen. One's already happened, the destruction of the temple. Now somebody asked me the other day on, on the internet, so what gives you so much confidence that these things are going to happen in the end time? Why do you really think that's going to happen? I mean, it's just words on a page in the book, right? I said, well, you know, if you look at all those words on the page in the book, and you see all the things that were prophesied about the things that would take place at specific points in time, and that they've all taken place at that point in time, I'm pretty confident that this rest of this is going to happen as well. That gives us a sense of confidence. It's like a little child growing up. If his parents always tell him to do something and never, never have discipline to make them do it, and they just go on about their business, well, they learn pretty quickly they don't ever need to listen to their parents. Well, this, this, is, this is Daddy talking to us, and he's wanting us to know there's something going to happen here, and there is an end of history. So the first thing has happened, and he already, we've seen that in history, and this is going to happen, this is yet to come. The sign of the coming at the end of the age, or the end of time as we know it. So here's, here's that timeline that we looked at, not exactly the same timeline that we looked at because it was a little more detailed than this when, when we were doing the Revelation study. But let's, let's look at this. So here's Jesus' teaching right here. This is, let's say, this is the time right before uh, the crucifixion at the Olivet Discourse. So he's teaching in this time frame. So Jerusalem is destroyed here, 70 AD. Then there's other events that are going to take place where Jerusalem 
is restored to the Jews. That's a prophecy that's going to take place in history as well. Well, has that taken place? Yeah, the Jews are back in Jerusalem. No other time. The Bible prophesies this is going to happen. And with no other people at no other time in history have people been run out of the country completely desolate of any Jews. And so there's really two uh, dissipations, dispersions of the Jews that takes place in history. They're completely gone from Jerusalem. And now they're completely back in Jerusalem, just as was prophesied. So there's going to be a restoration. It's already happened, 1943, and then the, the Six-Day War in 65. Uh, Luke gives us some, a different view of this as well. He says, they, the people in Jerusalem, will be brutally killed by the sword or sent away as captives to all the nations of the world. So this hadn't happened yet. The people were in, in Jerusalem at this point were primarily Jews. And Jerusalem will be conquered and trampled down by the Gentiles. Boy, that didn't sound like very good news to the people he was talking with. Until the age of the Gentiles has come to an end. So where does that fall on our timeline here? So there, this restoration of the Jews right here, and then all this time in between these is what is called the time of the Gentiles. So we have been in this time up till the time that this was restored, and now we're living in this in-between time. We're going to look at something out here in just a minute, but we're living in this in-between time of the time after the restoration. There's going to come a time that we don't know the exact time or the season that is called the Great Tribulation. There's going to be seven years of horrible tribulation. And what the apostles are wanting to know, what the disciples are wanting to know, is what are going to be the signs of this? Well, how are we going to know this is about to happen? Well, I have an opportunity to, to tell others. Well, yeah, your opportunity is right now. Your, your opportunity is now to tell others about the coming of this, of this Christ. He's going to come again. The Great Tribulation is going to take place. Now, there's some good news in here uh, because this tribulation is not going to be very good news. I mean, we think this past year has been tough on a lot of us. We hadn't seen nothing yet. There, there's a time coming that is, that is horrid. Now, I know you came to church this morning for some good news. Good news is coming. Believe me, but, you know, it, it, I had somebody tell me, I think this was a professor, yeah, it was Tom Howe, professor at, at Southern Evangelical Seminary one time. He says, you can't appreciate the good news till you know the, the bad news. Well, there's a lot of bad news in this great tribulation period. Seven years of absolute horror on earth that's going to be taking place. Mark 13, 19 says, For those days will be a time of tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation, which God created until now, and never will. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, that seven years, unless he had shortened and kept it in a tight time frame, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, for the sake of those who would accept Christ, during that tribulation, there will be some in that tribulation who will be saved. Some that will come to know the Lord. Some are going to wake up and go, my brother was right. My neighbor was right about this. And, and some of them will come to know the Lord during that time. But it's going to be a horrible time to come to know the Lord physically because you can't buy and sell food. You got, you're going to be totally persecuted. That's not, it's not something you want to wait on. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of those that are saved, the elect, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Luke 21 says it this way. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, when what things begin to take place? At that time, the Son of Man will come in a cloud. He's not going to put his foot on the earth at this point. He's going to come in the cloud. This is the good news for those of us that are saved ahead of this time. He's going to come with power, and he's going to come with great glory. These things will begin to take place 
Stand up. Lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. What's he saying? You're going to be out of here. Those that know the Lord before the tribulation begins are going to be out of here. There is a time right here. The church is taken out. That's called the rapture. The church is taken out. And that's going to take place before this tribulation time begins. After the tribulation, there's, there's the second coming of Christ where he will put his foot on the earth and he will rule and reign for a thousand years on earth. All of that is in this Olivet Discourse. This is what we studied in some detail for two and a half years. Every detail that happened in between. You're getting the headlines and not the bylines. All right? So Mark 13, verse 28 says this. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. He's going to give you an example. He's going to give you an illustration. He says, I want you to learn a lesson. Now, if he said, if, if all this stuff had been talked about, and then Jesus suddenly turns around and says, now I want you to learn a lesson from a fig tree. Would that get your attention? I, he's got my attention. He says, I want you to learn a lesson from the fig tree. When it buds, become tender, and its leaves begin to sprout you will know without being told that summer is near. What's he saying? When the signs I'm about to tell you about begin to bud, when these things begin to happen, you'll know the time is near. Now, since I was a little bitty baby, people have been saying, I believe that he's going to come tomorrow. I mean, there's been books written about telling exactly when he was going to come again in spite of the fact the Bible tells you you don't know the day or the hour. There's been books. When I was in college, I remember one was written, and everybody was just hyper. It was going to be a particular time at a particular day, and a friend of mine who was a football player at uh, Carolina and uh, reci recipient of the Brian Piccolo Award, by the way, a really a neat man, was standing with me on the campus of NC State University, his rival, and we were looking, it was raining just like mad, and it was, and lightning strike came across the sky, and when it did, there was this big tower, an electrical tower, and all the water on it just lit up, and it looked like it was just bright, brightened the whole sky. And he went, it's happening, it's happening. I said, no, we don't know the time of the hour, and as soon as the man wrote those words on that page, God wasn't gonna come back right then. I promise you, we don't know the time or the hour. But he says, these are the signs. I'm going to tell you what those buds look like. I'm going to tell you what those leaves look like. I'm going to tell you how to get, start getting prepared. Now, the thing that's encouraging to me, I'm encouraged as a Christian about this, is the fact that those buds are beginning to open at this point in my life. And we're seeing those, those signs begin to really sprout out. They're no longer leaves that can't be seen that are hidden inside of the branch that are going to sprout out at some point in time. These are beginning to bud and sprout out. And, and as a Christ follower, that should be an encouragement to you. Because Christ is going to take us out of here ahead of this coming. Just so, when you see the events I've described beginning to happen, you can be sure that, this, that his return is very near, right at the door. Verse 21. And then, if anyone tells you, look here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't pay any attention to that. Wait a minute. I thought he was going to tell me, some, he is going to tell you some signs, but some, there's going to be deceivers in this world. Elvin and I lived in Colorado for about six years, and seven doors down from us, there was a guy that proclaimed himself to be the Messiah. Now, you, you might think, well, he was just nuts. I mean, he must have roamed the streets just nuts, a crazy man. No, he had people that followed him from all over the world, thousands and thousands of people that followed him, thinking that this man is the Messiah. He says, as soon as they start pointing to somebody and says, this one's the Messiah, come over here, this one's the Messiah. Let me, let me just give you some good news. When he comes back, you're not going to have to guess. There's, there's going to be a public announcement all over the world. Everybody is going to be able to see this event. Hear the words of the Lord. 
all at the same time. This, this is not an event that you're going to have to go, oh, I think he's over here. Come over here. I think this guy, he sounds like Jesus. No, you're not going to have to wonder. It's going to come as a blast. And you're going to know it right out. He says, false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform miraculous signs and wonders. So as to deceive, even if possible, even God's chosen ones. Some, I would say, I would say it this way, many sitting in churches today will be deceived by many of those Christs that are out there. Right in our what, one little community in Colorado, we had two professing to be Christ. And they, and they had good following. In terms of numbers, they had a good following. But he says, you're not going to have to wonder. Don't be deceived. Even if possible, God's chosen people will be deceived. He says, watch out. I have warned you. Does everybody hear the warning? Don't be deceived. You won't have to guess when he comes. You will know it. It will be clear. Just so when you see the events I've described beginning to happen, you can be sure that his return is near, right at the door. So here's the general preconditions that he's given us uh, in the great tribulation period of time. Israel will be back in the land. Okay, well, that's, that's happened right now. Israel is back in the land. So do they have to come back to the land in order for this to happen? No, they've already come back. They're already there. So the, the, well, that's one precondition that's already happened. It will be a time of great population. Well, what, what, do, you, what do you mean by great population? How, how, where does the Bible say that? What, what is that all about? Well, let's talk about that just a minute. Revelation 9.16 says this. And the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. Now, at the time these words are written, there probably are not 200 million people on earth. And he is saying this is how many is just going to be in the army. Now, in order to sustain this, there's going to have to be somewhere between 7 and 9 billion people on the face of the earth to sustain an army this size of 200 million. So let's look at history here in terms of population. Here's, here's world population. I hope this is as interesting as it was to me. Here's uh, 2,000 years before Christ, 1,000 years before Christ. Here's uh, ground zero where Christ comes, okay? So this time frame, this is the population. This is in billions, 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion. And remember, we've got to get somewhere between 7 and 9 billion people. So all the way through 1000 AD, it was only about a half a billion people. By the time you get to 1830 is the first time that we've reached 1 billion people on Earth. 1830. So you say, well, where are we now? Well, let's take a look. 1930, there was 2 billion people. 1960, my lifetime, there was 3 billion people. 1975, I'm a year out of college, 4 billion people. 1985, 5 billion. 96, 6 billion. Today, I looked it up this week, fairly reliable source, 7.8 billion people on the face of the earth. We could now man an army of 200 million people. So that, that is in place. Number three, time of amazing technology and fiscal controls. Why do I say fiscal controls? That means that, that money control is going to be centralized. How, how is it that we're going to, how is it that, that, that it's going to be that you can't buy or sell food unless you have the mark of the beast? How is that going to be? Well, because there's going to be a very tight fiscal control system available. That wasn't anywhere close to thought of in the time. I mean, we're talking about the time of gold coins and, and wampum. All right? And, and so we're, we're tight, these kind of tight fiscal controls that says you can't buy or sell, even on a black market system, it's going to become almost impossible. 
global communications. There were, you know, it sometimes would take six months to walk across one province in the old world. Six months to walk, and we're going to have world communications that when Christ returns, everybody's going to know it all at once. How, how in the world could that, could that possibly fit in the mind of the people of that time? How could they think in those terms? Well, Revelation 11, 8 and 9. And their dead bodies will lie. It's unimportant who we're talking about right here for the purpose of this conversation. But some of you will remember who these two people are. And their dead bodies will lie in the street for three and a half days. Men from every people, tribe, nation, language, will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. People from all over the world, every tribe, nation, every tongue, every language, are going to see these guys laying in the street. How could that be possible? The technology we got today, it's not even a thought for us. We understand how that can happen. There's going to be devastating weapons. In the time that this is written, there's basically swords and spears is about the most deadly weapon you've got. But there's going to be devastating weapons. Let's look at some of the things that it's, that it's talked about here. This tribulation period, he says, will be days of great horror. A greater, greater horror than at any time since God created the world, and it will never happen again. In fact, unless the Lord shorten the days, the entire human race in this time of calamity will be destroyed. But for the sake of the chosen ones, he has shortened those days. Zechariah, this is a prophecy concerning these end times, from the Old Testament, he says, now this will be a plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples, bless you, all the peoples have gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet. What? And their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongue in their mouth while they stand on their feet? How is that possible? Well, this has to be some kind of a nuclear kind of weapon that would cause something like this evisceration and rotting to take place. We have such weapons today that weren't possible then. This looked like fiction at the time they were writing these things. Ten nation European powers. Right now today there's still, I think, 26 or 27 nations in the European Union. They don't all trade with the same currency, but a lot of them still do. You, you, you know probably that Great Britain has just pulled out of that. And I think there's going to be a reshuffling that will take place. There will be countries that will merge. There will be countries drop out of the European Union. But there's going to be ten nations in this European power. And so there's something you can look for. There's a bud that hasn't bloomed yet. But when those ten nations come together... We know from Daniel 2, 7, and 8, and Revelation 13 and 17, that you can be looking for this next step to take place. Here is the Maastricht Treaty of the European Union. This is signed in 1992. It says there'll be a creation without uh, internal frontiers. Before 1992, if you'd gone to Europe, when you crossed from one country into another, you had to stop, you had to be checked, Sort of like going from here to Canada. You had to, you had to, you had to, you had to check your car, uh, see if you're going to carry any fruit in, and that kind of stuff. But none of that takes place during the times that we live in. Elva and I were in Europe a few years back, and you can just go from France to Germany. You, you, don't, even, you don't even know you're going from one country to another except to see the old turnstiles that are still there that people used to walk through, going from one country to another. You just drive through that. You, you don't have to change currency. All the currency is the same. So all of that is, is coming together. There's an economic and monetary union that they talk about here. And ultimately including a single currency is the goal. To assert this identity on an international scene, in particular through an implementation of a common foreign and security policy. They want to have a common one world, eventually, security policy, but it's going to start with these European nations. A common defense among the European nations. 
So all of these are blooms or, or, or buds on this fig tree that Jesus is saying, watch for these things. It's going to be a time of great apostasy and moral anarchy. Now to understand this, you have to understand what these words actually mean. Apostasy means that you have fallen away from God. And this apostasy is taking place in the church. When you go to a church and it's more about entertainment than it is God's word, you know that you're in trouble. When you go to, to, to church and it's more about how you feel than what God said, you know that probably you need to be looking for another place. When you go to church and the only thing that's important is, is what they've got to serve to you, then probably you don't belong in that church anyway. There's a great apostasy happening in the church right now, and it starts with teaching that is outside of the hermeneutical principles that we've been teaching at Veritas. When you learn how to properly interpret the Word of God, the world opens up and you see things in a different way. When you're not doing that and when you're not hearing that, when you're not being taught that, the, the, the deceiver has an open door into your heart and mind. But when you know these things, and you know these things are true, then you're not going to be deceived by this guy that claims to be the Messiah, sitting in the back door of Cortez, Colorado. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's important to understand what God's Word actually says. Matthew 24 says it this way. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. There's going to be an apostasy in the church. And many false prophets will appear, not a few, but many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. They're going to look good, as somebody used to say to me, you look good and smell good and you're broke. You're spiritually broke. They look like Christians, they walk like Christians, they know all the lingo, but they're morally broke. God doesn't want us to be morally broke. He doesn't want us to be spiritually dead. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Now this word lawlessness, animus, means without law or moral anarchy. This is one of the reasons I wanted to have that conversation. And by the way, if you didn't listen to the first radio broadcast, uh, I was representing Christianity. There was an, an atheist and an agnostic. Agnostic just meaning, meaning that I'm not sure if there's a God or not. But within those three, there's three very different worldviews. And lawlessness takes place of moral anarchy. The reason I want to have a conversation about what happens once you have a particular worldview in terms of your morals is because there is going to be moral anarchy on this world, in this world, and most people aren't even going to notice it. So we, we end up with much of the church that's going to be deceived. And I, as a pastor, I do not want the church to be deceived. I pray the church is, that our church not be deceived, and that we have the, the gumption to tell others about Christ so that they're not deceived. Most people's love will grow cold, he says. Let no one in, in any way deceive you, for it, the tribulation, will not come unless apostasy comes first. So when you see the apostasy begin to happen, as Pastor Tom said, it's kind of beginning to already happen. If you don't believe it, I can take you to some churches fairly close by. Right over in Reading, right, Chris? Where some things are happening that are very strange. The apostasy is, is happening, and people are loving it. People are loving it. it it's, hey, it excites the senses. Well, 
For the the mystery mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. God is going to remove the restraints. Uh, 1 Timothy 3 says people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, unloving to one another, haters of the good, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Well, that's, 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 that's moral depravity. depravity. That's, that's what, what that is. is. As, As it was, was in the days of Noah. Noah. Think back, back if you understand and know about the times of Noah. Noah, Noah comes, comes out, out, he's all alone, man. He's going to, I'm going to build a boat. He starts building and people start laughing. And he tries to tell the message. And the thing we need to understand as Christians today is that even though you're speaking the word of God, it doesn't mean people will listen. But there will be some who will listen to what is going on. And that's why we must be about our father's business. Luke 17, 28 says, as it was in the days of Lot. Remember the time of Lot? He's living in Sodom. He's living in a place of great moral depravity. He says, it's going to be like that. In both of these cases, God rescues his own people. There's the good news. No matter how bad and desperate things get, God doesn't leave his people on the battlefield. And we need to understand that. We need to have that understanding, that aspiration, that confidence. The Bible calls it hope. Anytime you see the word hope translated in your Bible, Just Just put put in there, because this is a better better translation, at least in the way we think about hope, a confident confident expectation. expectation. We We should have have a confident confident expectation of all that Christ Christ is doing and the fact that he's not going to leave us on the battlefield. So these are the general preconditions. Of all of it, we're seeing most of that's already done. There's a new spiritual perspective a new perspective on spirituality. Mark 13, 32. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. Verse 33. And since you don't know when they will, they will happen, these things will happen. Stay alert and keep watch. Watch for the, for the signs of the coming. Now, let me just encourage you as a pastor. I can't help but do this. Don't wait till you go, well, there's a sign. I know that's a sign. Be ready. If he should come today, be ready. Please be ready. There's nothing better than knowing that if he were to come at this moment right now, that you're ready. And you would just say, come, Lord Jesus. The coming of the Son of Man can be compared with that of a man who left home to go on a trip. He gave each of his employees instructions about the work they were to do while he was gone. So Jesus has gone back to heaven and he said, here's the Great Commission. Here's what you're supposed to be about doing. Matthew 28, uh, 26, 18, uh, 28, 18 and 19. Here's your instruction. Here's what you're to be about doing. Share the good news with people. He gave each of his employees instructions about the work they were to do, and he told the gatekeeper to watch for his return. So here's here's the signs of what is going to be happening, but be prepared at any time. So keep a sharp lookout. Anticipate the Lord's return. How you live every day, anticipate his return, because the time is nigh. At evening, midnight, early dawn, or daybreak, Don't let him find you sleeping when he arrives without warning. When I say to you, I say to you, to everyone, watch for his return. There's going to be a new perspective on body life. That is the life of the church. The life of how we live together as the body of Christ. We need not be, I started to say pew warmers, chair warmers. 
We, we, we ought, ought not be chair warmers for, the, for, for Christ. I got my chair warm, Lord. Somebody comes in, I'll give them my chair. I don't think, I don't see that in the Great Commission, do you? No. He says this new perspective on body life, though, is going to have us serving one another and not just saying hi from across the room. It's going to have us living as the body of Christ, as a family, as the body of Christ. The good news is that when there is desperate need in our body, there's people that step up. I've witnessed it in the last month. Some of you have witnessed it in the last month. When there was a need. people stepped up and made sure that need was taken care of to take care of those in the body of Christ. And I praise God for that because as long as we've been apart, it'd be real easy for that not to happen if we're just depending on our carnal way. But that's, the body of Christ is going to become more centralized and genuine body, not just the celebratory, open the doors and play loud music body. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, in other words, whether we are alive or dead, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also were doing. And there's going to be a new urgency. I pray if nothing else good happens out of this whole COVID thing, that we begin to realize there is an urgency that we must have in the body of Christ. I was talking to some of the guys down at the uh, rescue mission down in uh, Santa Rosa, Redwood Rescue Mission, the other day. We're starting a new Veritas class down there in the coming months as well. They're doing auditing of courses now, but we're going to go down and get... Those guys officially signed up starting next week. So here's, here is a group of people that through this whole COVID thing, they said, you know, we were, we were close together before as a family, the body of Christ. They said, man, we're, we're rock hard now. These muscles have got strong. There's going to be some of that that's going to happen. There's going to be some that will fall away. Because it's going to be easier not to be in the body of Christ than to be in it. But there's going to be some that will realize that there's a new urgency that only the body together can do. I can only do so much. And many of you are talented and gifted with spiritual gifts in ways that I'm not. And God has placed us together, woven us together for a reason that you step up and take that role that he has designed you for in the body, as, as it says in Ephesians chapter 4, the body fit and works together just as it was designed by God to do. He fit us together for a purpose. There's going to be a new urgency. First Thessalonians, which also is talking about these end times, says it this way. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Now is it calling Jesus a thief? No, he says it's like. Here's one of those words, guys, from hermeneutics class. It's like. It's not. So the question then becomes, how is it like that? How is it like that? Well, then he goes on and he tells us. It's like that in the fact that he's going to come when you least expect it. The thief doesn't call you on the phone and say, David and Sandy, I'm getting ready to rob your house right now. Turn on your alarm. Call the cops. No, he doesn't do that. And he says, in that way, Jesus' return is like that. It's like it in that he's not going to come and say, I'm going to come tomorrow. He's going to come and say, here I am. That's the way he comes. So be alert, be sober, be ready. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the anticipation, there's that word of hope, translated in most Bibles as hope, Hope of rescue or anticipation, confident expectation of rescue. He's going to come and take his church out of here. 
That's the reality. So why this waste? I'm going to end as I started this morning. Why this waste? Why we waste so much time why do, we, why do we focus on things that are not nearly as important as what God says is important? Well, there's, there's a good reason for that. We don't really believe what he said. Because if we really believe what he says, then there's going to be that new urgency. Judas didn't really believe what Jesus said. And he was very upset about the perfume being spilled. What waste? The anointing of Jesus Christ. Oh, to have that opportunity to anoint his head and his feet and to wash his feet with my hair. What a beautiful opportunity. How little it was that Judas saw it as a waste. We're going to have a new urgency in this time. And I pray, I hope, and I pray that this new urgency will take hold in your spirit as it, as it has mine. This last, this last several months to me has been really difficult. It's been difficult not to be able to be together with you, to not stand here and see your eyes and your faces. To come in here, and, and, and many times I would come in here and just stand here alone in the last several months and just think, I wonder how this one's doing or that one's doing. And some of you have been in contact and we've talked and it's been, it's been an important time for me because I've been encouraged by your spirit. I've been encouraged by the stories of, of what some of you are doing for others of you. Because this is an unusual church. In that sense, it's, a, it's an incredible church. This is, this is now, the, I think, the fifth church that I've pastored in my life. I've never seen a church that loved one another like we ought to love one another more than this church does. We can still improve on that. But I've, I have never pastored a church that it's, that's, it's been as, as good and clean and right as this has been. And I'm thankful for you for that. I'm thankful to see every one of your faces this morning. I am blessed that you're in God's house to worship today. We're going to end with this hymn, I Surrender All. And after that, we're going to, uh, to have our tithes and our offerings. And at that time, I just want you to feel free. If you haven't been here with us during any of this time, I just open the box up here in the front rather than pass a plate because of the COVID stuff. If you've got a tithe or offering you want to put in the box, it, it, that's what it's there for. Uh, nobody should feel obligated to do that whatsoever. That's not what this is about. This is about your willful giving to the Lord. Uh, it's a time also to think about surrendering your soul to him, your spirit to him, asking him to be Lord and Savior of your life. And if there's anybody that would like to do that this morning, Pastor Tom and I are here to receive you. You can make that journey, just come up here and I'll be glad to pray with you. If you just have a prayer need, a prayer request, and you just want to come have me pray with you, I'll be glad to do that. You don't have to do that. It's not an encouragement to make you do that. But I want you to know that we are here as pastors, and we, we long to pray with you, as I have many of you on the phone. So thank you for being here. God bless you. Let's sing this, and then we'll have our tithes and our offerings.